director of summer arts. And we're so thrilled to have all of you. Those of you I can't even see way in the back. So welcome. Um, you're in for a real treat, a rare treat on this campus. We're having something very special tonight, which is a po uh, poetry readings by three world-class um, authors. They're playwrights, they're authors, um, they write fiction, nonfiction, just all across all their genres, and do performance art as well. So this is very special for our little campus here. Um, so I, I hope you enjoy the program. I'm going to begin. Um, I'm, I'm going to begin by introducing Amy Suzara, who is um, a poet and a, vo a spoken voice artist and performance uh, performance artist uh, housed in, in Oakland. She lives in Oakland and went to Mills College. We, um, she received her MFA in creative writing from Mills College. And she also happens to be a professor on this campus. So she's, um, she's home tonight, but um, has brought the world with her. So please welcome Amy Suzara. called Litany for the Sea. And this poem was written upon the BP oil spill in 2010. And at the time that I was writing this poem, I was researching uh, the Filipino settlers who escaped the Manila galleons and jumped ship and set up small uh, settlements in the Louisiana Gulf area. <clears throat> This is for the Vietnamese fishermen waiting in line for food stamps. For the Huma, the Creole, Croatian, Mexicano, nets slung loose like useless webs and sails run slack. You look like my people, brown faces chiseled with salt, seafarers, family men. And now the feds have come to check your papers even as you turn the tides back. With no masks for hazmat, you inhale toxins to the tune of threats and exploitation. This is for the children who would learn to study the sea and all of its swimming things. The lean of the hull or the taste of the wind, the speckled trout on the line, the marlin sword gleaming, the weight of a catch of shrimp. This is for the fathers who cry to see their ocean dying. For Alan Cruz who put a gun to his head as the sea became a graveyard. For St. Malo and Manila Village, where my people settled in 1763, yet no one ever hears this story. You brought Louisiana the dancing of the shrimp and hands made for harvest. Now there's oil in the grass. This is even for BP, making a show of short-term solutions. You've left 600 gutted sites abandoned in the Gulf. This is for the sea, your wounds so deep. Now your blood has hardened in the form of tar balls that wash up where children make sandcastles and carve their names with sticks. You carry the history of my people. It must have been like this upon arrival. Heavy air that settles on the skin unites with beads of sweat. Water always joins itself. It must have been like this, like home are 7,000 islands. And so you built a village on the bayou, the marsh buzzing and singing, familiar, thick like mud, like rainstorms, like Binabet or Yugao. It must have been like this. This is for the sea. I'm a lost child searching for a place to begin. Into your arms, my people jump from Spanish ships. You gave us passage. Far away, you hold my 7,000 islands to your breast. There cannot be enough apologies. I can only pray there's a suture, a mending of your wounds. But I'm not a surgeon, only a poet. And so I give you these words, words to sorrow the blood back into your veins. Thank you. I can send my some of you. <laughs> Thank you. So this is, um, so with this one, I'm just doing a lot of poems and I'm not gonna talk too much. Um, I'm really excited to introduce the next book. So I'm, uh, 
I'm just moving through the poetry. So next is called This House. And this is an older piece, but I, I feel, I picked it for this set because, um, you know, we're talking a lot about the personal to the political and uh, the house. I want you to think about spaces and how, um, we've talked a little bit about how there are ghosts in the spaces, right? And how places that we've inhabited carry the stories. So I want you to think about a place where the memories and the stories are fairly soaked into the fabric of the building. And this was written upon visiting my mother's ancestral home in Manila, where she grew up. And so this is called This House. This house, this heavy, this sickness, it surfaces this TB cough, pill pot, this wheelchair untended, this forgotten, forgotten pile of laundry in the unlit room back of kitchen where a million many-legged things lurk and so you touch everything gingerly, this mattressless bed that belonged to your grandparents, these yellowing photos of 10 minus one, this small heat manila always quick to embrace you, this crud on your arms despite always taking showers, this wanting to eat something sweet again, this sugar crash in the afternoon, this too salt taste of too much soy sauce, this up and down stairs to simulate purpose, this missing someone to hold you while you side lay sideways, these dust mites and mosquitoes that get you in the night, this old-fashioned religiosity, this Lola praying the rosary, this Lolo's ghost visiting because this was his territory, this someone not being here but loneliness is necessary, this culling a past that others want to forget, this watering of roots that have dried out for decades, this feeling at home in your bones despite your bones, missing home, this missing comfort but comfortable, missing this, missing this, missing this, missing this, missing, and this house, this house, this house, this house, this heavy, this house. Here is snaps. <laughs> All right, that means it comes in my class, or maybe not. Oh, that's so nice, like popcorn. Very warm. Okay. Um, the, I'm gonna have four poems that are from my book, um, Souvenir, and this one is from a similar chapter in which uh, I was thinking about going visiting home in the Philippines. Home, you know, what is home? A lot of our conversations have to do with that, right? And and also, this is a little bit about the projections we put upon each other, assumptions that we make based on markers of identity. And even though it is in fashion to be mixed race and or ethnically ambiguous and or kinky haired and light skinned and or dark skinned and straight locked and or with an unidentifiable accent and or checking the box that says decline to state. I've been called Pocahontas by a little white kid. Now let me estimate 29 times asked if I'm Native American and 23 times Tibetan or Indian or 19 times Hawaiian. Let, let me almost forget the times I was asked almost accurately, but then there were the times I really wished there was those other things. That's the funny thing. <laughs> and even though it's all about mango trees and banana leaves and avocado oil for healthy hair and skin and eating crabs with your fingers pre-Spanish fork and spoon and pre-KFC chicken you can be fed by dancing feathered natives that is true it all tastes good but really there's also the glue sniffing children with no shirts hawking towels cross cut with 12 year old strippers beer belly white men gawking cross cut with proper English speaking businessmen with Spanish names wives applying bleach skin products sold on every counter is not very romantic I assure you Okay, so moving to, so the only talking, <laughs> the talking I'm going to do, I can't see you, I can hear you, um, that's awesome, um, is a little bit about the book, uh, Souvenir, and that came out earlier this year, and basically it's organized into four exhibits of a fair, and it's sort of loosely based on the 1904 World's Fair uh, in Louisiana, um, in which human exhibits were very popular, and Filipinos were on display, about a thousand or more Filipinos were taken from, from their homes in villages in the Philippines to put, be put on display in something called the Philippine Reservation, and to live an artificial life to show to the visitors, and to show to the American public that uh, these new savages, these acquired people, this is why they needed to be civilized. 
Um, and this poem is actually not a, particularly about the Philippine reservation. It's about something I learned was that during, um, I spent some time in the museums and ex about the exhibit, and I learned that there were mummified parts, like people's parts that were supposed to be sacred objects that were buried and kind of taken out and opened and sold as souvenirs. So that's kind of what this is about. Suture. Oddities. Body parts wrapped to be sold as souvenirs. Cold fingers peel mummy layers, undoing the stitch. It is invasive, a sort of jigsaw suture the way Navajos and Igorots, Rajasthanis pose with elephants at the artificial Pueblo cave dwelling. You note the backdrop of painted sand pillars, that Disneyland cirrus cloud sky. Wool jackets rub loincloths, feathers tickle Victorian necklines. Hands sew together what does not belong. One day it will heal into something unrecognizable with the parts of a person, a teratoma with teeth, hair, and nails. Come upon these measured feet, this list of names without warning. Come from thousands of miles to witness the exhibit of the exhibit. Come to participate in something, for your own story does not allow you to participate. The candidness of naked eyes, bare chests devoid of goosebumps, the smoothness of distance, the shadows of the uncaptured. Something tells you to stop looking, but you are spun, sutured to your subject. This is the ones that are not fun. These are the ones that are sad. Okay. Um, so, again, many, many history thing is, so, not only was, when the Philippines was colonized by Spain for hundreds of years, of course there was a lot of resistance, but also when the United States came, now of course the history books make us think that it was a handover uh, in a treaty, right, from Spain to the United States, like, here you go. Um, and in fact, um, the Filipinos were fighting and resisting for many years. Some say only two years, some say up to 14 years, and I think the 14 includes a lot of the, the resistance that uh, wasn't really recorded um, clearly. And so this was, this is, um, takes place around the Filipino-American War. Now, like I said, a lot of the similar verbal and visual lexicon were utilized and recycled that were racist, coming from racist ideology at the time, and some of the words, even like the N-word, and treating Filipinos as rabbits and when they were hunting, kind of really dehumanizing. And there's a little bits of a song uh, interspersed with this. It's called water cure, which is another word for waterboarding. Water cure, a telegraph to 1901 from the future. Get the good old syringe, boys, and fill it to the brim. Life source, our liaison to the sea, lessened on Philippine insurgents, stop. Attempt to get confession, force the feel of drowning, stop. Cause water, lung pneumonia, cause pleuritis, cause adrenaline overload, cause irregular heartbeat, cause release of catecholamines, cause heart attack, stop. Proven despite CIA sanitation of a formal method, yes, one can be scared to death, stop. We've caught another N and will operate on him. If not from broken limbs or bruises, if not oxygen loss, if not vital organ failure, stop. And under this distress, one will admit to anything, stop. Post-interrogation, should one survive, now fear the gentle sprinkle on a rainy day, a pool, a shower, anything aquatic, stop. Administration and United Nations deem it form of torture, stop. Shouting the battle cry of freedom, stop, stop, stop. Wonder who the terrorist is. Thank you. So this is my closing poem, and then I'm going to turn into a host after that. I'm going to like, whoosh, magic will happen. Okay. Um, you're like, that's awesome. There will be all kinds of magic tricks. Okay. So um, this is called Tiny Fires, and it's my closing poem in my book. and. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I have been exploring is 
inha inhabiting different voices, and a lot of times those voices are not comfortable. Like I really don't like inhabiting the song, you know, the song of the American battle song. Uh, I don't enjoy a lot of the, but you know, they were nonetheless part of the voices that I was hearing, and I needed to include. And um, in this one, it's sort of like the. Uh, a voice from the past, an ancestral voice speaking to the future and the present, actually. And uh, the only thing I'm going to do to comment is three Tagalog words. Butiki, which is lizard. Butanding, which is a whale shark. And Tutubi, which is a dragonfly. There's no test, so don't worry, you have to memorize it. <laughs> However, hopefully the imagery will remind you. Tutu B, and one thing about dragonflies, which a lot of you might know that I'm very fond of, that they actually live in the water. They're born in the water and they have gills, they can breathe underwater, and then they actually walk on land before they become winged creatures. Um, so, that, with that. Tiny fires. Listen. We, Butiki, slid bulbous bellies over smooth rocks. We, gentle Butanding, carved the sea into milk. Now, Nestle carton bobs on the fetid waters of the Pasig. Children hunt for metal parts and plastic sacks. Open sewers gape like torn bellies. Pandakan birthed poets, but now it sits in the shadow of a fuel tank ripe for disaster. Of two CEOs gaze down metallic towers, cursing shanty dwellers, clicking mahjong, kicking sipa, butchering pigs in the hell below. We, blood stained to be, wings 30 feet spanned, could be seen drifting between storms and songs. We, 30,000 eyes, began with gills in the shallow edges of the river, could breathe underwater. I tell you this because a thing is happening and you may look upon your cracked sheaths and see a thing that we were not. You may call yourself John, Susan, Kate, wear old navy, smile when someone thinks you look like Brad, Jennifer, Angelina. You may tip cowboy hats, sling guns on hips, shift the gears of German sports cars, but one day the game is up. The ones who gave you compliments regard your eyes, detect your blood-stained wings pressing through your skin. This is why it is important that you listen and remember, we were not jars of talcum powder, not master creams and syringe serums cramming drugstore aisles, not teenage strippers in red light districts with faraway looks waiting for the Americano to take us home, not the Aita woman begging at the edge of the landfill where tiny methane fires light up the mountains of what the world has tossed away. We, Butiki, we, Butanding, we, Tutubi, could breathe underwater. Thank you. Okay, so now, I have now become the host of the evening. Um, so, thank you so much, and I, thank you for the opportunity to share my work, and I hope that this creates dialogue. It's all about the dialogue and conversation, so later on, you know, Feel free to talk with me about things that you had questions about. Um, I'm very, very excited to introduce our headliners for the evening. Um, with uh, it's great, my great pleasure, and uh, we have our week two guest artists for the course. Which those of you who may not know, uh, I'm coordinating a course called Social Action Writing: Personal to Political Words at Work. Where are you guys at? <laughs> All right, and. Um, so, I'm going to start with the first. He has been called by poet Elizabeth Alexander, one of the most important writers of his generation. And the National Public Radio has described his poetry as crystal clear, mixing a timeless myth-making energy with strong contemporary conscience. Winner of the 2012 Barnes & Noble Writers for Writers Award, recognizing his service to other writers and the broader literary community, a 2009 Emmy Award winner for his work documenting HIV AIDS in Jamaica. He is the author of 16, 16 books and many other works in poetry, prose, and drama. His recent work, Duppy Conqueror, New and Selected Poems, was published last year by Copper, Pop, uh, Copper Canyon Press. He is also 
the editor of the journal Prairie Schooner and a professor of English at the University of Nebraska. Please warmly welcome to the stage Kwame Das. Um, I want to thank Amy for that introduction, but especially for that reading. That was a beautiful reading. Uh, really, really powerful work. I also thank her for the invitation to, to come here. Um, and it's great to be reading with Sharon as well. Um, so, we should have a good time. Uh, and thank you all for being, being here. Um, So I think I'll read some poems. Um, let me do this uh, timing thing so that I don't go over my amount of time. So there's going to be an alarm that goes off. <laughs> and at whatever stage of the poem I'm at, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> okay. Write my name, write my name up there, write my name, write my name up there. You fit touch my finger on the golden pen. The golden pen, oh, the golden pen. Touch my finger on the golden pen and write my name up there. We're going to start with a poem for Kofi Awona, a poet from Ghana, where I was born. For the last 10 months I've been reading his work. He died 10 months ago, approximately, in Nairobi, Kenya. We were there together for a festival called Story Moja, and um, he was killed in the terrorist attack that took place in Nairobi that year. We will return, I'll be returning to Nairobi um, for Story Moja again this year, and um, we'll honor him, I'll give a lecture in his name. But I thought it would be good to keep remembering him. And this is a poem called Counting the Years by Kofi Awana. As usual, as in the earlier dreams, I come to the whistling shores, the voice of the high-domed crab stilled. But a chorus remains of the water creatures of earlier times, of the birth time and the dying time, the pity when we resurrect the travelers, the anchor man on our singular boat that will take us home. Kofia Wana. This is a poem called Progeny of Air. It's set in Canada. I lived in Canada for a number of years. Um, I, after I got my PhD, I was in a band, and so we were waiting for... <laughs> yes, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> And uh, so we were waiting for the big break uh, because it was going to happen tomorrow. Uh, and tomorrow, and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace. Um, well, it didn't quite work out because then, um, you know, I got married, had a kid, my wife thought it wasn't funny anymore. And so, um, so I got a real job. Uh, but in the meantime, I worked part-time for the Canadian government, the New Brunswick government, and instead of doing, well, I did the work, but I did it fast, and then they, uh, I just wrote poems in the, uh, they thought I was out in the field, but I was actually locked in the room writing poems, and it, you know, give me a free computer, what the hell do you think is going to happen? <laughs> um, so this is a poem from that sordid era. It's called Progeny of Air. It's long. <laughs> the propellers undress the sea, the pattern of foam like a broken zip opening, 
where the bow cuts the wave and closing in its wake. The seals bark, gulls call and dive, then soar loaded with catch. The smell of rotting salmon lingers over the Bay of Fundy like a mortuary's disinfected air. Fish farms litter the coastline, metal islands of cultivate metal islands cultivating with scientific precision these grey black pink fleshed fish. In the old days, salmon would leap up the river to spawn, journeying against the current. They are travelers. When tucked too low, searching for undertoes to rest upon, they often scrape their bellies on the sharp axi and bleed. Now watch them turn and turn in the cages, waiting for the feed of colorized herring to spit from the silver computer bins over the islands of sea farms. And general, the biggest of the salmon has a square nose where a seal chewed on a super freeze winter night when her blood panicked and almost froze. Jean-Pierre, the technician and sea cage guard, thinks they should roast the general in onions and fresh sea water. It's hard to read mercy in his stare and matter-of-factly way. He wears layers, fisherman's uniform, passed from generation to generation, the plaid shirt, the stained yellow jacket, the ripped olive green boots, the black slack, trousers with holes, the whiskers and eye of sparkle as if salt sea has crystallized on his sharp cornea. He guides the boat in, spills us out after our visit with a grunt and a grin, willing us to wet our sneakers at the water's edge. The sun blazes through the chill, the motor stutters, the sea parts, then zips shut and still. Stunned by their own intake of poison, the salmon turn belly up on the surface, then sucked up by the plastic piscillator, they plop limp and gasping in the sunlight, one by one. The glove technicians press with their thumbs the underside of the fish, spilling the eggs into tiny cups, destined for the hatchery. Anesthetized eyes glaze shock on the steel deck. They know the males from the females. Always keep them apart. Never let seed touch egg. Never let the wind carry the smell of burthen through the June air. On burden now the fish are flung back in. They twitch, then tentative as hungover denizens of nightmares. They swim the old Sisyphean orbit of their tiny cosmos. The fish try to spawn at night, but only fart, bubbles, and herring. <laughs> On the beach, the rank saltiness of murdered salmon is thick in the air. Brown seaweed sucks up the blood. The beach is a construction site of huge cement blocks which moor the sea cages when tossed 80 feet down. They sink into the muddy floor of the bay and stick. There is no way out of this prison for the salmon. They spin and spin in the algae green netting, perpetually caught in limbo, waiting for years before being drawn up and slaughtered, staked and stewed and in the morning silence the sun is turning over for a last dose the silver startles the placid ocean against the gray green of deer island a salmon leaps in a magical arc slaps the metal walkway in a bounce and then dives cutting the chilled water onto the other side swimming swimming is general this is my fantasy with the square nose and skin gone pink with seal bites escaping from this wall of nets and weed general swims up river alone, leaping the current with her empty womb, leaping, still instinct, still traveling to the edge of Lake Utopia, where after so many journeyings, after abandoning the secure world of spawning and living at the delicate hands of technicians, after denying herself social security and the predictability of a steady feeding and the safety from predator seal and osprey, after enacting the Sisyphean pattern of all fish here in the shadow of the Connors sardine factory, she spawns her progeny of air and dies. <sighs> Canada, we go to South Carolina. 
Uh, this is a poem called How to Pick a Hanging Tree. I went to a plantation in South Carolina. I went to many, but I went to one in particular, and um, there was a tour. It turned out most of the people were touring to check it out as a venue for weddings. Uh, I was interested in history, and so it became problematic when I started asking unfortunate questions like, <laughs> where did the slaves live? Or then they went into the kitchen, and I said, oh, so the slaves weren't in here. And they went, well, we, we, uh, it's a lovely kitchen. Um, so, so that went on for a while, and then the woman eventually said, can you, can you go to the front office? Because I think they can answer your questions. And so I did go, and uh, I could hear the applause as I left. Um, so I was then taken on a tour, and I was shown a tree, and I was told this was the hanging tree. How to pick a hanging tree. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, scent of magnolias, sweet and fresh, then the sudden smell of burning flesh, Lewis Allen. Young trees may look sturdy, but they have no memory. They're green so near the surface, they bend with a sudden weight. And the truth is that not all trees can carry a dead man's weight with enough air between pointed toes and earth, with enough height so the scent of rotten can carry far enough to be a message for those who are sniffing the muggy air for news. Old as it may look, craggy bark, twisted branches, drooping limbs, old as it may seem, sitting there by the edge of the canal, that live oak understands the simple rituals of hanging. See, there is the natural notch where the rope will slip and hold it. And here, angled like this, the damp air off the river carries the decay for miles and miles. Sometimes a fresh tree will simply die after the piss of a dying man seeps into its roots. Sometimes a tree will start to rot from guilt or something like a curse, but the old trees seasoned by the flame of summer lightning and hardened to tears know it's nothing to be a tree, mute and heartless, just strong enough to carry a man until he turns to air. This poem is called Black Funk. It's, uh, you have to imagine that I'm a woman. A very sexy woman. <laughs> what else? I interviewed some women in South Carolina in 1995, average age about 80 years old, black women who lived through Jim Crow. And I wrote poems responding to these interviews because I couldn't help myself. They were so moving and so powerful. So Black Funk is one of those, and I think I'll read two poems from that sequence. The rigid of my jawbone is power forged in the oven of every blow I have felt. My water walk is something like compensation for a limp. Don't begrudge me my sachet walk. It's all I got sometimes. Because I know the way you stare pale blue eyes like a machete edge catching the color of a new sky. The way you barely whisper your orders, spit out the food, complain about my shuffling gait, snorting out my funky smell, find fault in each task I do, never right, never good enough, curse my children like dogs, cause I know you just hurt and drooling your bitterness when my back is turned, when the shape of my black ass swings the way you hate, sashaying through this room of daggers. 
I know you're wondering what I got down there in my belly, in my thighs. Make him leave your side, crawl out of his pale sick skin and howl like a beast at night. Whimper like a motherless babe suckling on me, suckling on me. You can't hide the shame you feel to know I sometimes turn him back. I know you know it from the way he comes on you hard and hurried, searching for a hole to weep his soul in. Yes, I turn him back when I want, and he still comes back for more. I got my pride sometimes. I know the way you tried to read me, tried to beat me, can't be me. Never be me, never feel the black of me, never know the blues in me, because you never want to see you in me, even though we bleed together, finding each other's tidal rhythms and blow together like sisters, hoarding the waters of the moon together. So I will sashay through your life, averting the blade with my leather skin. I abuse you. And when he balls, that is my pride at work. All I got sometimes. I'll cook your meals until he keels over. And you just have to take it. Because I took it with no fuss when he forced his nothing self on me while my babies sucked their thumbs within the sound of my whimpering. I'll pay, baby. I'm just reaping what y'all done so. Silbon. Take my baby home. Take my baby home I ain't free And never will be Take my baby home Oh, glory Oh, glory, there is room enough in paradise to have a home. I still count them, feeling them like ghost limbs. There is a place in my collection of years. Remembering them is a way to remember to count the pressure pills, the heart pills, the blood pills, the tyranny of pills. I count those who died before they woke, those I cradled, caressed, cocooned to live, hoping beyond the weakness of their cries. They died too, leaving us with tough questions for God Almighty. Old black folk have buried so many babies in the bush behind the cotton groves, with a naked form of cotton bales standing like sentinel crucifixes against the stale blue of summer skies. Oh, glory. Oh, glory, there is room enough in paradise to have a home. And mother gathers her body and the, and, the, and, and the tears and builds new fires, cooks new meals, readies her womb to replenish its root itself, to make more brothers, sisters like second nature. She carries her mourning like second skin away to count the days. My mother bore nine children. We chant this as a litany of her strength. Three did not see their second year, and she did not live to see the second year of her wash belly, wash soul, wash body. The thin film of her drying birth waters scraped off with a rough cloth as they laid her out to rest. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Long way from home. <clears throat> <clears throat>
There's a poem that should lighten up your day. <laughs> anyway, this is a poem that uh, is based sort of loosely on the work of August Wilson. Uh, it's called If You Know Her. And it's kind of, it's about, it's about like a woman. Uh, it's not about my wife. Um, I make that very clear. Although, I must be clear also that I couldn't write it if I wasn't married to my wife. So, right. <laughs> so this is like the three poem warning. I have three more poems, all right? So, and then, I'm, then I'll be done. If you know her. If you know your woman, know her rhythms, know her ways, if you're paying attention to her all these years, you will know how she comes and goes, how she slips away even though she's standing in the same place. You will know that her world is drifting softly from you and she may not mean it because all it is is she's scared to be everything, scared to be finding herself in you every time, scared that one day she will ask herself all 40 plenty years of her where she's been. If you know your woman, you will know that mostly she will come back, but sometimes when she drifts like this, something can make her slip, and then coming back is hard. If you know your woman, you can tell by the way she puts on heels and she does not sachet for you because it's not about you. How she will buy some leather boots and not say a word about it and you only see it when she walks in one night and she says she's had them forever. And you will see the way she loses the weight and pretends not it's nothing. But when she isn't seeing you looking, you can see how she faces the mirror, lifts her chest to catch her profile and how casually she looks at her eyes for signs of life. If you know your woman, when you're gone, she will find things to do, like walk alone, go see a movie, find a park, collect her secrets, and you won't know because she's looking for herself. And she won't tell you that she wants to hear what idle men say when she walks by them, because what you say is not enough. If you know your woman, you know when she's going away and you will feel the big hole in your love and you can't tell why she's listening and humming to tunes you did not know she heard before and she will laugh softly at nothing at all. If you know your woman, you will see how she comes and goes and all you can do is wait and pray she will come back to you because you know that your sins are enough for her to leave and not return. It's pretty disturbing really when you think about it. <laughs> Okay, good. Two more, right? You good? All right. So, this one is called The Egg and the Teacup. This is for my wife. This is a poem about our... You know, sometimes, you know, we've been in workshop, we've been talking about the difference between facts and truth, or the relationship between fact and truth. Uh, sometimes a poem comes that is as honest as you can muster. And um, this poem is as honest as I can muster. Uh, but there's a beautiful image that I got from Haiti that's in the middle of it. It's called The Egg and the Teacup, and it's for Lorna, my wife. One, perhaps I should have asked your father for your hand, and perhaps he should have said no just to show us he could. Then we would not wonder if it mattered to him at all. We might not have felt so on our own. Two, they never made your wedding. A cousin had one too, and they had to go and said, and they said, and, and they did. And you, they thought, could take it, and we, they thought, could handle it, so we did. He may not have meant to, but he taught me not to fear your body broken easily. But you were strong, weren't you? It takes years, years to learn how much you've longed to be the fragile one, the delicate vessel. Three, this is my betrayal, to think you could take it. 
while I cut the fragile catastrophes of others for my vanity and the lie of misplaced care. Forgive me, forgive me. I am learning the language of husbandry, how to mend beauty, to listen to the power of a broken thing, a cup, some china, almost transparent, two broken pieces in a bed of soil, gleaming. Four. Not that you never tried before, I simply choose to read it as your stoic way. You binging on a box of jelly-filled donuts, devoured in front of me and always followed by the coolness of an insouciant accusation and firm pushback alone. And you would command and I fled, you tested me so often and I failed you. Still, you gave me an open door as if you thought your test too hard too advanced for me, how we compromise for love, how we survive. I'm grateful for those vivas retesting inside our hot house, my hands learning to caress. Five, and you did not hesitate, I know, to face the violence of cancer. It looked as if the body would at last show me your wounded self and I would see how tenderly you wanted me to touch you inside, far inside. So it was not the fear of death, nothing like that, just the knowledge of how it is written that these things hidden in the dark will be revealed. I see you now. I hold you gingerly. I will learn you. I will. Six, harder than a stone, but more fragile than an egg. As if in the dark of youth, one can tell them apart, the egg from the thunder egg. And I'll end with a poem called In This Same. And it's a poem that ends poems, and I hope you enjoy this. There is a way to end books, the gathered papers, the weighty gift, the clean parade of words in columns of paragraphs and in columns of images. The tidiness of things and numbered, they form the thing you have labored over for years. To end a book, you tie a blue ribbon around the heft and make a bow and kiss it. The way to end the year of cataclysms is to find a piece of land by water where old boats rot at the edges and the place smells of ancient things, sulfur, salt, rotting fish, and the deep musk of mud and grass, to then sit on a moving jetty, rocking against the universe's pulse, and there wait for the moon. To end this way alone is to end with the hollow melancholy of loss and regret. Better to end with the voice of your woman, for you will need that voice, ordinary as rain, talking your name. Perhaps it is the intrusion of her scent filling the air, or the cool of her touch slick with tomato pulp and herbs. I know the gender of the poem, do not worry, it is because I know the name of the bodies standing in the dusk by the water, Kwame and Lorna. They will hold hands, and in this saying, the poem ends. Touch my finger on that golden pen, that golden pen, that golden pen. Touch my finger on the golden pen and write my name up there. Thank you. Let's give that one more time for Tommy Bell. After uh, our final performance this evening, there will be a book signing out in the lobby, so stick around, and bring your books, and hang out with the authors. So, her most recent theatrical work, River Sea, was called Mystical and Moving, a ritual of transition and healing by the Minnesota Star Tribune. Her performance novel, Love Conjured Blues, had audience members rising from their seats as they witnessed the raising of characters from memory, imagination, and the dead, according to one reviewer. A resident playwright at New Dramatists, 
and the playwright in residence at the University of Iowa's Playwrights Program, Bridgeforth, Sharon Bridgeforth, works in the theatrical jazz aesthetic. She collaborates with actors, dancers, singers, and audiences live during performance as she composes moving soundscapes of her nonlinear texts. A touring artist since 1993, her work has been awarded, among others, the 2012 MAP Fund and the National Performance Network Creation Fund. Her publications include Love Conjure Blues, the Lambda Literary Award-winning Bull Jean Stories, and experiments in a jazz aesthetic, art, activism, academia, and the Austin Project. Let's please give a warm welcome to Sharon Bridgeforth. exquisite artists that bless the room, the space, the stage, the air. So thank you. Um, and, and I want to thank uh, Amy for inviting me. Um, I love summer arts. What about you? Um, so I need 12 of the social action writers to join me. So come on up. Uh, the ushers will help you come along the sides. Yeah, thank you. And while they're coming up, um, <laughs> Thank you, you guys. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause for being brave. Okay. Almost. Okay, here we go, here we go. Yeah! Thank you, you guys. So, um, I've been thinking a lot about elders, um, because I always do, and because I've been um, blessed with a lot of them in my life, um, and it's really them that I feel that I aspire to tell stories like. So, in my, I'm a child of the Great Migration, so my family's from uh, Mississippi and Memphis and Louisiana, but I grew up in LA. And I remember hearing food cooking and what my mom calls finger popping and somebody singing and somebody crying and somebody praying and stories are being told and basically a lot of things going on at the same time. And I now know that in all of that and in all of the other things that I remember experiencing with them, hard and you know, good times. I, I, I know that they were telling me who I am uh, and how to survive. And so being someone who's now moving towards being an elder, a lot of my elders have transitioned. And so I think about them a lot and I think about this a lot. And you know, recently my Angelo and Lil Jimmy Scott and so many others have also transitioned. So I want to offer this to the ancestors, all of our ancestors. I want to invite you to place your energy, your voices, your breath, um, and your stories in this with me. Um, your attention matters, so give your attention with intention and just know that, you know, uh, I is we. So we're all standing here because somebody worked 
and sacrificed and was brave enough to dream. And so I'll be inviting you to name some names, um, and I'll be inviting you to do other things as well. So one thing off the top is um, if I do this, I'm inviting you to gesture. So this is for you guys as well. So gesture. So you don't have to do what I'm doing, but offer a gesture. And you all ask, yes, right now. So when I do this, and if you all are moved to, yeah. And so being that we're making jazz together, or maybe we'll call it gumbo tonight, uh, we want to offer with intention, being present, and really, really uh, uh, giving to what wants to happen in the moment. And if I do that, that means stop. <laughs> if I don't do that and you're doing something, just do it until you are done. Um, if I do this, I'm inviting those of you that are bilingual or multilingual to offer words that, are, that you translate. So they could be whatever it is that wants to come through. So I know some of you up here are bilingual, so right now, let me just hear you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Sing it if you want to. Okay, so out there, feel free to as well. So when I do this, I'm inviting you to offer, I call this, in my mind, it's the celestial choir. So I'm inviting the celestial choir to join up. Um, if I do this, I'm inviting you to share stories. So share something from your experience, share something that you've written. It could be a piece of text that just moves you, that, that is in your heart at the moment. So let's try that. Okay, good. So lots of things will be going on at the same time. You have to be loud enough to be heard, but not so loud that you're not in concert. You have to pay attention to me so you know when to come in and out. That's my mama's kitchen. <laughs> I know there are musicians here, so I'm just going to push. Because um, I'm also really celebrating being here with artists and with people that are here working with intention for personal growth and expression. So who can do a clave? So you can do it. Okay. Yeah, baby. Okay. Do that clave. identify yourself to me. But uh, two people that are interested in um, improvisation that would be willing when I signal to come here and just jam with me, okay? And so, and by jamming with me, I mean that in a jazz sense. So I don't want you to in, uh, interpret what I'm, I don't want you to do what I'm talking about in the story. I want you to respond to what you feel in the moment and help move it forward. Okay, so first let's go over some of our other signals and then I'll ask two dancers to identify themselves.
So the thing will be to really deeply listen with your essence and remember that um, everything is being done in support of the collective voice and the collective experience. So um, just be mindful of that. So who are the two dancers that are going to volunteer? You may have to stand up because I kind of can't see. All right, yes. If that's three, well, three is great. Do I see three? It's five. It's five. Oh, wow. Okay, I think for safety's sake, we better just say four. Let's just keep it at four. Just because there's not all that much room up here. All right. So I'm going to show you your signal, and when I do this, you know, just remember you're in it as soon as you stand up. So make your way down, uh, just really listening and being mindful. Um, don't take too long, but uh, so don't come now. Um, uh, but when I when I start the work and I do this signal that I'm about to show you, yeah, you don't get a chance to practice. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> but but. You know, we're just gonna be in it, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do it. Um, so when I do the signal, just come down, and we'll just jam. And uh, I'll just let you know you'll do two, so it'll be the last two uh, that I read from. I'm not reading all that much, guys. I promise. <laughs> but um, so when you transition from one piece to the other, just stay in it. You know, do what you need to do to feel into the next piece. So here's your signal. All right. Who are your ancestors? Put their names out in the gumbo. Who are your ancestors? Name them. Railroad tracks, biscuits, and bacon. Grandma and, 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 and my dear. Ain't sweetie and them that old moonshine. Bad shit, bad shit, bad shit. Sour pickles, daddy done picked out the garden. He self done picked out right there out the garden. Ain't nothing but a cucumber. Uh, 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 uh. Cucumbers treated special. You know, neck bones, greens, chitlins, and cobbler, and, and mama sweet potato pot. Yeah, don't work no more, don't work no more, don't work no more, don't work no, no more. But sometimes I remember everything just too much at once. See, there was Big Pretty Tom Fruity and Mr. Gladys. Say, Big Pretty Tom Fruity and Mr. Gladys. Yes, sir, they was always kind. Used to give me a nickel for stirring the gumbo. Just stand there and stir the gumbo, because you know you got to stir the gumbo. And they were never gonna stand still long enough to stir the gumbo. Too busy getting ready for Friday to come. But I always have like stirring the gumbo. Just stand there, listen. I, 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 I try not to remember, but can't help it. It keep coming back. All those things keep coming back. My mind sees too much. I, 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 Pecker was a took my baby brother, they took him, they beat him, they beat him, they beat him so bad till, ooh, they took him, they, 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 they just took that baby boy because he wouldn't turn around when they said, hey nigga, and, 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 and well, we just went raised like that. We knew who we was, we knew who we was. Mama raised us men, we walked like men. My, 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 my baby brother wasn't no nigga. He always walked like he was going somewhere because he was. And why in the hell would he turn around because some teenage pecker would call him he out his name like that. He had on his uniform just back. I told him he should have stayed gone. Dirt in the blood, dirt in the blood, dirt in the blood, dirt in the blood. 
Where to go, where to go, can't remember, can't remember, can't remember, I, 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 turn left, no seat, right, 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 left, how it go, how it go, how it go, I can't remember, I know it, I know it, I know it, I know it, mama said, mama said, always pray. This is what I know, this is what I know, this is what I know. Circle, 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 dirt in the blood, I clay. Salt in the night, I moan. Deep from belly, I rain. Waves crash, sun, I sand. Earth, turn, run. I, 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 I am. I keep dreaming this dream, this man, lady, he, she, come to me in my dreams, he, she, black, black, like the most beautiful night sky, eyes shining like stars, he, she, skirt, deep blue, dark, like he, she, skin, look like she, he, hair, got a thousand fishes and pearls hanging all the way down past he, her, behind. This man, lady, she come to me in my dream. She take my hand, pull me down, down, down to the bottom of the ocean. At the very bottom, I see things like down there is all them souls. All them black, 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 like most beautiful night sky souls. Plus so many more, so many more. They take up all space and time. They down there, they down there. They look at me, they eyes, they pierce. I know they're trying to tell me something, but I always wake up right when they mouths open, right when they mouths open and fishes and fishes and pearls flow out. I always wake up right then when I see that, always wake wet, not from sweat, from sand and seaweed. And then there is old King Sharp. He done shrunk it down so till all you see is that big old cane he yield like Noah. Old King is sharp as a tack, mostly. Mind bright, mostly. He quick on his feet, mostly. See, old Caney Sharp been old as long as anyone can recall. He got a hair trigger for stories. He got cock to tell over and over and over. Yes, sir, the sound of he came tapping the dirt clear the entire road. Even the infirm scatter. Cause Lord help you if you get cornered by old Caney Sharp, you ain't never get loose. Yes, sir, old Caney Sharp just be talking. And it be the same set of stories, like a deck of cards, except you don't get to pull. Old Caney sharp as a tack, sharp as a tack. Old Caney talk till your mind just bust open in your head. When he finally decide to move along, you left there just a rocking and mumbling to yourself. Mm-hmm. Why everybody is upset now is stories that used to be a straight line now circles. He circle stories, now straight lines. And he done dropped a whole set of new ones in that ain't nobody heard before. Like all of a sudden, he talking about he Ethiopian great granddaddy who was a free merchant. What Ethiopian? We know about the French man, we know about the free man, we know about the Choctaw, we know about the Igbo. We ain't never heard about no Ethiopian. Is new truth coming forward? Is he old things forgot? Is he done gone crazy? Have the veil moved? Or is all of what was just a pack of lies? We don't know what's going on in old Caney Sharp mind. That is why we call Honeypot in off the road. Honeypot, old Caney Sharp's baby sister, third daughter, second child. Honeypot, he favorite of all. The only one he paused for. So we sent for Sugar, who sent for Sweetie Junior, who sent for Delroy's, who up on the road with Honeypot. Let's just say word got passed to Honeypot to come on home. <laughs> Meantime, now instead of running, we seek old Caney Sharp out, sit on down, invite he talk. 
We all sprawled out over at old Caney's little old piece of house, hanging out porch and window, trying to fit. Let old Caney Sharp talk and swing his stick, giving orders for the get his sippy cup and things. Right when old Caney Sharp making his second round with the story of his Ethiopian great granddaddy was a free merchant, he door bust open. In step honeypot now. All heads swing to the light. Old Caney Sharp paused mid sentence. Honeypot stormed to the middle of the room where old Caney Sharp sit. She knock over about three or four people, step on more. But she get in there, bend down, look old Caney Sharp in the eye, stare long, long, and hard. Old Caney Sharp stay paused, let Honeypot take he in. Then just like that, Honeypot and them turn, storm out the shack, dust down the road before anybody, including old Caney Sharp, could say how to. Well, eventually, old Caney Sharp sip from his cup, swing his stick around, pick his sentence up where he left it, and complete his second round of the story. Well, what came to pass was old Caney Sharp wasn't fixing to die, which we should have known, because most likely whatever he got in his sippy cup done pickled and preserved his insides. Mm -hmm. Old Caney Sharp done lost hair, teeth, and weight, but he still got plenty life in him. What had twisted old Caney Sharp's mind was he worried over his great-grandson, Mary, who had gone to the north and lost his mind. Apparently, the boy heart got crushed when he come to find that reports of the promised land was riddled with inflammations. Merrick got to chasing bad women's and the numbers instead of he dreams. Then bad men's with guns got to chasing him. So Mo Pretty told Duck, who told Delroy's, who told Sweetie Junior, who told old Caney Shar that Merrick time up in the north on the run was closing in on him. So here, where to, for, and whatnot, Honeypot had to get called in. Mm-hmm. After reading old Caney Sharp's face like a book, Honeypot rolled onto the north. There she picking up a new singer for she band. We hearing this new one can hold a note so long and so hard and so high, make a thin glass bust in your hand. Yes, sir. There is joints in the north only serving mason jar to this day after Honeypot and them got through up in there. See, what had happened was, Honeypot and them throwed Merritt up in a dress and heels and wigs and pearls and lipstick and such. They stood he as center stage, hide in plain sight. Next, Sugar, who's so fine she make your mind go blank, spread the rumor that Merritt had been shot down in the street somewhere. So by the time Honeypot and them finished their tour of the North, guns had been called off Merritt and a shining new star had been born. What nobody could have known what to expect was Merritt got the voice of an angel stored up in his ass. So when Honeypot had told Merritt to just stand there and hush, feeling so pretty and all backed up with broken dreams and trouble, Merritt said he couldn't help it. He just had to open his mouth, let all he heart and soul release. Baby, it was legendary. The people just lost their minds got to falling out and jumping up and reaching for the hem of his she garment. Merritt opened that crowd up so wide they started calling him Miss Kitty. Apparently, the doorkeeper, Slice, come running from she post, laid down at Merritt's feet, pledged to never leave. Something about that touched Merritt's soul, and seeing that got Honeypot to feel tender. At the end of that first night, she tells Slice to come on, so Slice joined up as muscle. Not that that bunch needed all them knives and guns packed up in all them titties and drawers. <laughs> anyway, Merritt done disappeared into he love of dresses and sounds and things, so now we call he Miss Kitty. Slice lived to make Miss Kitty happy, and Miss Kitty loved he some slice. Eventually, Honeypot and them bring Miss Kitty and he sliced by old Caney Sharp so the old man can see everything is all right now.
mama and daddy couldn't do nothing with he. So grandma ain't pork chop call a council on he ass. The people pour into mama and daddy's house wait. Finally, Hacker come on home. Like always, he wiping somebody woman lipstick off he smile. Walking up, he thought it was a regular party. Oh, there was dancing and food and shine all right, but we was all business up in Hacker and mama and daddy house on that day. Soon as Hacker feet hit the porch, he mama snatch him in and he daddy latch the door. Grandma ain't pork chops, get to work. Spit on head and forehead, pound with open palm. Am I the only one seem to wonder why Grandma ain't pork chops always spitting and slapping on somebody's head? Anyway, spit palm, spit palm, black honey pull up spin. Hack a spin, hack a right, spit palm, spit palm, spit palm. Sweet Roger, catch he, spin he left. Spit palm, spit palm, spit palm. Right spin, left, little nene pull, she breath out on spin. Spit palm, spit palm, spit palm, spit palm. Turn left, spit right, breathe. Hack a mama and daddy, close eyes, rocking and moaning and crying in the back. Spit palm, spit palm, spit palm. Left, breathe, right, rock, moan, cry. Big Susie grab, hack a, Rip his shirt off in one pull. Rub potion on each chest so fast and hard. Smoke raise up. Big Susie then toss Hacker in the spin. Spit palm, spit palm, spit palm, spit palm, spit palm, spit palm, spit palm. Spin left, right grip. Spit palm, spit palm, spit palm. Spit palm, spit palm, spit palm. This go on, who know how long? fall out on the floor, get to writhing and retching and foaming. He down there wrangling with the devil, I suppose. We leans over, watch in silence. Hack a writhe and retch, foam, wrangle so till even the devil must have got tired, because all of a sudden, hack a steal. Set fast rise and fall of chess. We watch now. Hack a slowly come back into himself. Chest rise slow, eyes open. Hack a look round. Smile. Clouds gone. Eyes clear now. He cried. Snort and snot, sob. Thank you, 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 thank you. Hack a mama and daddy get down on the floor, lay on either side. They cry too. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Everybody cried now, including me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We say in greeting this new day. she dreams. Tickle, hug tight. Stand, smile, watch, pray, touch, heal. Whisper worries away. Whisper grief away. Whisper loneliness away. Whisper fears away. Whisper sadness away. With sweet grass, sea salt, and sage, copal, cedar, and moonlight bring gifts. Joy here. Dreams here, tenderness here, blessings here, divinity here, you here, 
spirit here, family here, all here. Lift now, fly now, free now, be now. It's okay, not alone, not alone, not alone. Always we whisper love. Thank you. Thank you so much once more.